morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. If you'll stand with us for worship this morning, we'll start out by singing Open Up the Heavens.
It's very good to see everybody here this morning. We have quite a few gone. I know vacations have started and the summer has begun. Yay! <laughs> so finished with the school year, and so that's wonderful time, time to spend at home with family and kind of recoup from a school year for those of us that are in school and things like that. So um, it's good to see everybody that is here. If you are new with us this morning, um, and if you are a member, in the front of your uh, pew or chair is a connect card, and we'd like your information on there so we can connect with you. And um, the, on the back is anything, any decisions, or if you'd like more information about the church and different things that are involved. So if you'll just fill that out and leave it in the seat, um, and it'll be picked up at the end of our service today. Um, there is a few more announcements. We have June Bible readings are available for you on the Welcome Center at the back. So um, you can have those available to start um, your June Bible reading through the Bible in a year. So um, those are back and available. <clears throat> uh, today at the Bethel Friends Church at 1230, they're having the Kansans for Life luncheon. So lunch is provided, and they're going to talk about uh, the new law being proposed for Kansans for Life um, and the valuing them both amen amendment. So I, we don't know exactly what all that's going to entail, but hopefully give you an idea and a summary of um, what they're looking at for that bill um, as we get ready to vote on that later on. Uh, so you are all welcome to go to that, and that's at 1230 at Bethel Friends Church. Uh, for prayer requests, I have to keep Robin Romy and her family in your prayers as she's in Ethiopia doing ministry there. So be sure to lift them up in your, in your prayers this next week, too. Uh, do I have any other prayer requests we need to add to our list or any praises? All right, very good. We do have a couple of birthdays this coming week. I know Faith is not here, but her birthday is tomorrow, uh, so we're excited about that. And then Olivia turns 10 on Tuesday, so uh, if you um, are if you're in the greeting time, just wish them happy birthday also. And Rita's. When is Rita's? Is it tomorrow too? Oh, I didn't realize they were the same day. How cool. <laughs> okay. And Rita's birthday also, so... Drop them a little note on Facebook or something and say happy birthday, <laughs> or give her a call. Um, so, uh, you are welcome to stand up with one another and greet one another this morning. In the name of the Lord, tell somebody you're glad they're here this morning.
morning. As we uh, enter our time of communion, we remember the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross so that an unworthy population of believers could be promised a place in heaven beside our Lord. Well, it's interesting uh, many times in kind of a common theme in, in literature and cinema is that people are flawed, but yet deep down people are inherently good. The Bible, however, paints a little different picture of people's inherent qualities. And we don't have to read very far uh, to find a couple examples. The first, uh, Genesis 6, 5, we read, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. And then again, we go to Genesis 8, 21. And we find that this is after the great flood and, and God was pleased with Noah. And he said this, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent towards evil from childhood. So we pause at this time uh, this morning to remember and honor Jesus' crucifixion that, that wipes our sins clean, the, the sins of the followers of Christ. And it is only through Christ Jesus that such a really a sinful world could find a home in glory. Would you go with me, please, in prayer for our, our uh, communion, please? Father God, we thank you for sending your son to the cross so that we can have the promise of eternal life in heaven if we choose to follow you. We ask your blessings on these emblems as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus so our sins could be wiped away if we become true followers of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings you give us. We thank you for the blessings on this church, Lord. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
the kids are dismissed for children's church at this time. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Father, thank you for each one here and their desire to worship you together. Father, just uh, be with us as we open up your word and we read, read from it, how, we, how you display love and how you want us to uh, follow your, your example. So, Father, I pray that uh, you give us the wisdom we need to understand, the courage, the strength, and the boldness to put it into action. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Two weeks ago, we took a look at what Jesus called the two greatest commandments, which is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, and it's to love your neighbor as yourself. Last week, we took a look at uh, an example of Jesus' love and how we can love God. And Jesus had a uh, was secure in his relationship with God. He had a love for God enough that when the storm ar- uh, appeared, that Jesus was able to trust God enough to even fall asleep in the middle of a storm. He, and uh, that he was woken by his disciples, and then he re- calmed the, sea, the waves and the wind, and, and, and then showed, that his, showed his, default, his followers that they can trust God. They can trust him in the midst of life's storms. And today we're going to be in Mark chapter 5 where we find that Jesus was a man on a mission, a very important mission. In fact, this, um, this mission was a, a, a literally a matter of life and death. Uh, Jesus was on his way home having just crossed back over on the Sea of Galilee and this time it was without anything eventful, uh, anything happening. It's just a regular trip across. And, and once he reached the shoreline, uh, it was back to the normal for Jesus. The, the crowds were, were waiting for him. Uh, people were there. And, and, and before he was on shore for very long, a, um, an anxious parent threw himself at Jesus' feet. Uh, his name was Jairus. Uh, he was a leader of the synagogue, and, uh, but he wasn't there. He wasn't to see Jesus about any official church business, or he didn't want to have uh, another theological debate with Jesus. Instead, he was there as a frantic father. Uh, Mark 5.23 tells us that he begged Jesus, saying again and again, My daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. Jairus was in need of a miracle, and Jesus, having a heart of compassion, was willing to provide a miracle for him. And as Jesus embarked on this life or death mission, though the crowd went with him, verse 24 says, a huge crowd followed Jesus and pressed on every side. And following Jesus through the midst of the crowd was an anonymous woman. A woman who was unnoticed and unimportant to just about everyone else there. But like uh, But like Jairus, this daughter of Israel was in need of a miracle, and she was seeking out Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to look at her story and what Jesus did for her. So let's read her story. Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. 
Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she had been freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched me? But Jesus, you see the crowd crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. No one had noticed her. No one even cared that she was there that day. Everyone else was far more concerned with whether or not Jesus would be able to heal the official's daughter. This man was a wealthy man, a religious leader, yet, and he had a, a daughter who was dying. What could possibly distract Jesus from such an important mission? What would drive this woman to take such desperate actions? Roger Campbell, in his helpful handbook, makes special notes of not only her desperation, but also her determination and her deliverance. But it was, without a doubt, her desperation drove her to see Jesus. Now, although the Bible leaves out the unpleasant details of her issue of blood, it was quite likely a chronic discharge of blood. Whatever the specifics were, the Bible says in, in verse 25 of Mark 5, it said she had, su- had been suffering from chronic bleeding for 12 years. I can't imagine what that would be like. I don't know if any of us could imagine that. But her condition left her woeful, left her weak from all the blood, blood loss, feeble and fading. Luke, when he records this uh, story in his uh, gospel, and remember, Luke him is a medical doctor, he, he adds that her condition was incurable. His diagnosis left little, very little hope for this woman. Sadly, delivering the news uh, of, in Luke 8, verse 43, she could not be healed by anyone, but yet she had tried. Verse 26 tells us she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. It's common in those days when difficult medical situations presented themselves to seek treatment from multiple doctors. In fact, we sometimes do that today if we have a certain issue and we get one opinion, we'll a lot of times go to another doctor to get a second opinion. So she kept going back to other doctors to see and getting another opinion. But to her detriment, though, the medical treatments in the first century were not always sound. In fact, it was quite the opposite. They were often cruel and painful, more like medieval torture than modern medicine. Add to her hurt the humiliation and the degradation that she experienced because of the nature of her bleeding. No doubt this woman was suffering and had been suffering. And to top it off, she was not getting any better. In fact, she was getting worse. And even though she was seeing all these different doctors, nobody had good news for her. Her desperation, however, was, wasn't just physical. This woman had spent every cent she had on doctors who used and abused her, and now she was left with nothing. She was completely broke. How would she buy food? How would she pay her bills? 
maybe pay off some debt that she had to some, some doctors because she had ran out of money. Every day was overshadowed by dark clouds of financial catastrophe and the looming knowledge that it would not get any better. She had no job, no money, no resources. So she was, in a word, desperate. Sadly, her constant flow of blood also left her in a perpetual state of ceremonial uncleanliness. The law of Moses said in Leviticus 15, verse 19, when a woman has her monthly period, she is unclean for seven days. Anyone who touches her will be unclean until evening. Now, this law was intended for a woman's protection and, and respect, probably to protect a woman with cramps and discomfort from unwelcome advances, as well as to prevent the passing of contagious disease and give the woman rest from family responsibilities. Unfortunately, it also left this woman continually unclean, which to a Jew placed her just about on the same level as a leper. And we know what happens to the lepers. They, nobody wanted to be around them. People couldn't be around her in case she, they, they, that she touched them or they touched her. So socially, she would be an outcast. Anyone who touched her or was touched by her would also be considered unclean until evening. So if anyone did notice her in public, the shouting would begin, unclean, unclean, warning everyone within earshot of her impeding threats. Now even if she did have money to buy food, how is she, she, how is she supposed to get it? She can't go to the marketplace because of you know, the possibility of someone touching her. So she had to have somebody who was willing to go to the marketplace for her to get food and anything else she needed. Some of us may have an idea of, or a small taste of what that was just this past year. If you had COVID or were quarantined because you had been exposed to COVID, you couldn't go anywhere. Today, we have the luxury of still shopping at Walmart and a lot of other places because you can have curbside pickup. But they didn't have that back then. So she had to have a kind neighbor or a, a family member who was willing to, to go and get these things for her because she wasn't allowed in public. And that's bad, being isolated. But for her, her situation was worse. How can it be worse? Well, she was also cut off from God. Her ceremonial uncleanliness prevented her from ever entering the temple. You know, for us, it might be like if, if a pastor was not kind enough, not loving enough, and, and, and shared the news that you just can't come to church because you're too sinful. This would be worse. Because like unlike today where you can stream any service, almost uh, any service uh, that you want online and, and still get to worship or, or, or hear a sermon or, and, and sing along with others, there's ways to do that without personally being present. For them, they believed that the temple was the, actual, was the place that contained the actual presence of God. They had to go to the temple to make their sacrifices so she couldn't go and offer sacrifices for her sins. She couldn't worship God. She, so in, in their world, she had no way to experience his presence. So physically, financially, socially, and spiritually, she was desperate. But desperation, when seasoned with a glimmer of hope, often turns to determination. And this woman had been given a glimmer of hope. In our passage this morning, in verse 27, it says, She had heard the reports about Jesus. Let's stop and think about this for a little bit. Put, try to put yourself in her situation. She's been told she can't be cured by anyone. Her, 
her situation is hopeless. She's never going, she's never going to get rid of it. But then perhaps a neighbor happens to see her when she's dropping off some, some food for her or whatever, places at the doorstep and says, hey, I heard about this man named Jesus. He can make, he can do some things about, uh, he, he, he can heal people. And, and I wonder if this unnamed daughter of Israel, she just kind of says, well, I, I doubt it because all the doctors have told me I can't be healed. But then maybe a family member shared a story. You know, there's a man from Lazarus who can make the blind see. They call him a prophet and he makes crippled men walk. His name is Jesus. They say he is the Messiah. Could he be? She thinks, could he really be? By the time Jesus came to her hometown where she, he was on this life and death mission to, for, for Jairus, he had, the, the people, he had healed the sick and the downtrodden people throughout the region. And stories about him were spreading everywhere and she had heard probably most of them. She was hearing he was healing people by the hundreds and bringing hope to the hopeless. And I can, I can just see her, she's thinking to herself, could this really be my chance? After 12 years of suffering, could Jesus really be my answer? Could he be the one that could heal me? So with a little bit of hope, her desperation changed into determination. She is determined to be healed. We know this by the trips of two multiple doctors. She hears that Jesus is coming, so she, and she was determined to see him, determined to touch him. In verse 28, it says, She thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Then the day comes. The news is here. He's here. Jesus is here. He's on his way to the synagogue leader's house. He'll be coming this way. So the question is, is, how does she get to Jesus? She bandages herself up, and I'm sure she covers her face so no one would recognize her. And then she takes that deep breath a lot of times that we do, that when we're trying to find the courage to do something that we're uncomfortable doing or we're not sure about, and she steps out onto the street. The crowd is just huge. There's people everywhere, and they're, and, and she, and they're just pressing to get closer to Jesus. She's in danger. She could be trampled, which would then could possibly injure her even further. And, she, and if she's anything like many people who are worriers, she's, she, the, the, the thoughts of worry start to come in. What if the bandages just soak through and somebody sees the blood? What if they start shouting again? What would Jesus think of her? Would he be disgusted with her? Would he reject her too like so many other people have? And then she pushes those worried thoughts to the side and she decides it doesn't matter. She's going to do whatever it takes to get close to him, to, to touch him. Besides, I'm just going to reach out, I'm going to touch him, and then I'm going to slip back into the crowd. I'll, I'll be unnoticed, and, 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 and no one's going to pay any attention. Well, at least that was her plan. She pushes and crawls through the crowd, so to speak, and as Jesus was hurrying to this dying girl's side, he, he got closer and closer. She finally was within reach. And then that thought goes, do I dare? Could I, can she possibly go through with it? Dare she try? And, and before she realizes it, she reaches out and she touched him. Verse 27 tells us she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And this is where her deliverance began. Verse 29 tells us instantly her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she had been healed from her disease. Can you imagine the relief that she must have felt? I wonder what it would be like to have experienced this 12 years of suffering and just in a moment it was over. Her desperation had ended and her deliverance had begun. 
I've never been in a situation this extreme. So I can only try and imagine. The interesting thing is, is Jesus noticed her touch immediately. Verse 30 of our passage tells us at once Jesus felt power go out of him. And that's when he turns around and, and asks, who touched me? Now, his disciples there, they, they think he's crazy. He says, Jesus, look around us. The people everywhere, people are, are trying to touch you and, and reaching out. Everybody wants your attention. It might be easier for us to find someone who didn't touch you. So they say, don't ask such a question. We don't know. But Jesus kept looking. He kept looking through the sea of faces, looking for the one person who had touched him. At first, this woman tried to slip away, but Jesus was insistent. He says again, who touched me? Now, she knew it was her, and she knew what she had done. And because of the fact that she knew what had, what had happened to her, the, the change in her body, her being healed, she knew she had to confess. So what does it say? Verse 33, you know, it tells us that she, the woman then knowing what had happened to her came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, she took him, she told him the whole truth. Now I can't help but notice that in our, this story here and then just maybe an hour or so before this with Jairus meets Jesus for the first time. What did he do when he talked to Jesus? He threw himself at Jesus' feet. Now we just got done with a series of, of looking where Mary threw her, you know, was at Jesus' feet and we found that wonderful things do happen at Jesus' feet and we still got people putting themselves at Jesus' feet. To be honest, putting somebody, you know, going to somebody's feet, you're, all, you're basically putting them, yourself at their mercy. You, it, it, it's a way of showing submission. And this woman is there. She's at his feet. And as the Message Bible says, she gave him the whole story. You know, when you hear a, the whole story, it, it takes time to tell a story. And we need to remember that Jesus doesn't have a whole lot of time because he's on a life or death mission. He's too busy to stop and listen to one woman's sad story, right? The thing is, is how long had it been since anyone listened to this woman's story? How long since anyone cared enough to listen? The thing is, Jesus did. Jesus cared. He postponed his immediate mission, his life or death mission, to listen to the sad story of a lonely woman in need. Jesus showed her a love that is both patient and kind. But he wasn't done by just listening. After hearing her out, Jesus spoke and... and, 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 and I wonder if the words that Jesus spoke to her were music to, to her ears. He says in verse 34, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, had she been able to sneak away like she wanted, just kind of go unnoticed, she still would have been healed because she was healed instantly when she touched but the thing is that she would have missed out on a greater blessing. And that blessing is Jesus calling her daughter. You see, Jesus was willing to hear her, to heal her. But he wanted to do some, so much more for her. He wanted to include her into his family. To call her his own. To give value to her. John MacArthur notes, the form of the Greek verb translated has made you well is the same Greek word often translated to save and is the normal New Testament word for, for saving from sin, which strongly suggests that the woman's faith also led to spiritual salvation, not just physical. Now, she wanted to be healed, but she received what was so much more than she could have ever imagined. And if you stop and think about it, that's how Jesus works. That's what he does. If 
fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, it says, With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. Can you relate with this woman in the story? Can you relate to her desperation? Do you know what it's like to be broke? To have bill collectors calling every day. Or maybe they're not calling, but to sit down at the table after payday and go through the bills and to realize not only is there more bills than there is money, but you can't even make the minimum payments because there's not enough money. And you're desperate to find what to do. Are you familiar with suffering? Have, have you lost somebody so close that you just don't know how to go on without them? Have you ever sometimes felt as though you couldn't even turn to God? The woman whom Jesus healed represents all of us when we are apart from God. Without Jesus, we're all broken and desperate. But like her, we too can be delivered. There really is hope for the helpless and rest for the weary. Jesus offers grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing, and love for the broken hearted. That day there were dozens of hands pawing at Jesus, reaching out to him, but only one hand reached out in faith. This desperate woman was deter determined that Jesus was the way, the only way, for her to be delivered. So she reached out to Jesus. She was an anonymous woman, unnoticed by so many, but yet she was not unnoticed by God. No woman, no man, no one who comes to Jesus in faith will ever go unnoticed. Jesus reached out to people in love and, and left changed lives in his wake. Can't we do the same? Now, we may not be able to reach out and touch somebody and heal them. But can't we be his hands? Can't we be the ones that reach out to the desperate, to the diseased, to those who are depressed, and reach out to them with the love of Jesus? We need to remember that genuinely loving Jesus means learning to love like him. To do what he does. It isn't enough to just receive his love. We also need to give it to other people. I want to close this morning with a story told by Alan Webster about a lonely man who was much like this woman. Only he wasn't able to find deliverance. James Lee was a young Chicago father who called a newspaper reporter to say he had sent a letter outlining his story and, and that he was going to sh kill himself. The reporter frantically traced the call, but it was too late. The police arrived to find Lee slumped in a tavern phone booth with a bullet in his head. They also found a worn child's crayon drawing, much folded on which was written, Please, leave in my coat pocket. I want to have it buried with me. The picture was signed in a child's print by his daughter, Shirley, who had died in a fire five months before. Lee had been so grief-stricken, he had asked strangers to attend his daughter's funeral so that way she would have a nice service. He had said that there was no family to attend because her mother died when Shirley was only two. The heartbroken father told the reporter that all he had in life was gone. He felt so alone. He gave his modest estate to the church Shirley had attended and said, maybe in 10 or 20 years someone will see the plaque and wonder who Shirley Ellen Lee was and say someone must have loved her very much. We need to remember that Jesus loves people through his people. Meaning Jesus loves people through us loving people. 
How many desperate, lonely people like James Lee go unnoticed around us each day? When school's in session, how many kids sit alone? How many kids sit alone, not just at lunch, but maybe at study hall or in every class? How many kids don't have a partner because nobody just wants to be around them because they just don't want to be their friend because they're unimportant? How many lonely people do we work with at work? How many lonely people do we see when we walk down the streets of Hugoton? You see, they're hard, sometimes hard to spot because they don't carry signs to let us know that they're desperate and they're lonely. They're at their rope's end. The thing is, if we are truly following in the footsteps of Jesus, learning to love like him, to love our neighbors as ourselves, then we need to be the ones who are looking for them. Not being satisfied with just the simple answer to our question of how are you, and they give us the typical answer, I'm good. How, do we, how many times do we go, no, I really, are you doing good? I really want to know. Will you actually stop when you ask them and say, how are you? I really want to know. Be willing to pause your day and to listen to their whole story. To find out how they're really doing. To be willing to listen to them. So that way we can be Jesus to them. So they can see that Jesus loves them. That he wants to cover them in grace. And he wants to love them. And he wants to let them know that he values them. To love Jesus means we need to go looking and be willing to see, to find those who are desperate and lonely and to give them hope, the same hope that we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for another day to just to gather together as believers to worship you to feel your love, to feel your presence, and to express our love back to you. Father, I pray that because we've experienced your love and your deliverance, Father, help us to be determined to go out and have our eyes open to see those who are lonely, those who are desperate, those who are searching for hope for you. And Father, when we find him, we just pray that you give us the words and the wisdom that we need to share you with them, to love them as you would love them, to be your hands of love. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today, for each one here, whether they're here in person or they join us online. I just thank you for their love for you. and their Father, I just pray you give us the courage and the boldness and to go out and to, to love others like we love ourselves, but to also to, to show them how much we love you by reaching out to them, to give them the hope that we have in you, to let them see how much you care and how much you love them and what you have done for them, that you want them to be your children. Father, I just pray that we can, uh, through your power, through work, work, working through us, just show them you so we can bring them to you so Jesus can save them. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.